My name is Michael Denemy, and tonight what I want to talk about is uh, test-driven development in Rails. The, uh, the inspiration for this talk actually came out of the Boston Ruby Project Nights. I was uh, talking to a lot of people who were beginning their uh, Rails journey, and when I asked them about how they were testing, I heard a lot of reasons why people weren't testing, and they were reasons that I was familiar with for my introduction to test-driven development. I think we have to acknowledge that getting started in TDD is, is pretty hard, uh, especially depending on what kind of background we're coming from and what tools we've worked with in the past. So hopefully we'll put some definition around some of that tonight. Uh, I started actually using test-driven development back in 2004 on a, on a very large uh, automation project, a robotics project. Uh, it was a project that was in a lot of trouble. It was behind schedule. We had a lot of defects. And I thought test-driven development was a complete waste of time. We were already behind the, uh, the eight ball. Tests were very hard to write. Um, in my mind, we were writing twice as much code. So probably excuses that a lot of you who aren't sure about testing are familiar with. Since then, I've really seen the light, uh, realized that one of the reasons things were hard to test was because the software was very tightly coupled. And even though I used to think it was okay to test things through the debugger or looking through log files, the problem with that is you can't do that on a large project and you can't go back and check everything uh, that you've worked on in the past. You can't do that sort of regression testing. So the other benefit that you see with uh, test-driven development is that you have the ability to automate these tests and make them part of your build suite. And yes, I have a WordPress blog and I'm very sorry about that. So we're going to go over some basics of TDD tonight. I want to, I want to put some terminology around uh, things that you may hear in, about the TDD landscape and try to put some clarity around that. We're going to talk a lot about uh, workflow. And one of the major pieces of test-driven development is the notion of red-green refactor. And we'll get into that in a lot more detail later. And then just look at some of, what are some of the tools that are available out there, uh, what kind of tests can I write? How do I write my tests? And then hopefully we're going to spend most of the time on looking through some code um, to actually see how all of this works. So why do we test? Well, well you know, what? anyone? Any reasons why? Okay, well there's a lot of reasons why we test. You know, I think the, the more obvious reasons are things that we want the code to work correctly. Uh, we want to, you know, we want it to be right. But there's more subtle re uh, reasons for testing, too. We, we might want to find some way to drive the design. We may want to specify the behavior that we're, we're looking for. Uh, in some ways, we even want to document the behavior of the system through the tests. And... Uh, so there's a whole slew of reasons why we test. It's not just the obvious, well, because my boss told me to. Um, and something I want people to keep in mind tonight is this quote from Kent Beck, who was one of the, one of the real early adopters of test-driven development way back in probably like the 80s. Uh, yes, there was computers back then. Um, he said test-driven development was a way of managing fear during programming. And what he meant by that is, you know, a lot of times we're faced with problems and we're not necessarily sure how to solve them. And that uncertainty is what we're really trying to get at with test-driven development. If, if we aren't sure of even the problem that we're trying to solve, we can use testing to drive that design even drive the behavior. What is it that we want, and then how do we want to implement it? And tonight, we'll probably uh, write some tests that maybe a more experienced Rails developer um, might not write, or maybe would write in uh, fewer steps than we're doing. But again, it gets back to that uncertainty. If we're not sure how, say, Rails routing works, we're going to take small steps to see how we make uh, those that functionality work in our system.
So how do we do test-driven development? Well, the first step is that we write a test. And what we do in that test is we define the behavior that we want to see. And we run the test. And that may sound like a silly step. Uh, we haven't written the code yet. But this is a really important step and one that, you know, I'm really going to stress that you you try to follow in your own practices. You want to see that failing test first. One, it tells you that your test is correct, um, but it also sets up the, the cycle that we're going to go through. Um, and very often you will write a test and it won't fail when you think it should. And you need to understand why that is. Did you write the test correctly? Is it not a good test? Seeing that initial failure is a very important step in the process. The next step is that we write code to make the test pass. And it's, it's also important that we write the absolute minimum to make that test pass. Uh, you may have heard people use a term called YAGNI. Um, you aren't going to need it. Don't start putting in extra stuff. Let the next test drive that. Uh, do the bare minimum to get this test to pass. Because again, we're working on a cycle. Uh, I think it'll become a little bit more clear as we go through some code, but you're just trying to take small steps and take the smallest step that can make the test pass. And again, this sort of gets back to that Kent Beck quote about fear and uncertainty. Um, you can take bigger steps if you know where you're going, if you are very familiar with the tools. Take smaller steps if you're not sure where you're going or you're struggling with the implementation. So now we run the test and it passes. And this may not happen all in one step. You may make some mistakes along the way. Uh, I know I did in preparing for this talk. And now we do a very critical step in the process. We refactor. And when we talk about refactoring, what we're trying to do is improve the code so that we take out the duplication, um, we make it more readable, maybe we make it more modular, modular. we uh, can put things in, in helper functions or private methods or things like that, trying to make the code uh, better. And it's really important to follow these steps in this order. Oh, and by the way, when you run the test after refactoring, uh, it better still pass because if it hasn't, you've you've in the course of refactoring, uh, you've broken something. And again, so it's an important step to run those tests afterwards. And what I just talked about was the whole red green refactor cycle that you will hear people talk about in test driven development. We start with a failing test, we write just enough code to make that test pass, and then we clean the code up. And we do this over and over and over again. Don't sit down to write an application. Sit down to write a series of small features in an application. And something important too here is, you know, use your version control system. If you have implemented a feature through this cycle, check in the code when you're done refactoring. Um, how many times have you gotten into a situation where all of a sudden things stop working, you've got 15 files modified, and you're not sure what, uh, what change caused the problem. So by following this cycle, you, you tend to develop really good habits of working small, working with your version control system, not getting too far ahead, or ahead of yourself, keeping your code clean, uh, not adding features that, that aren't necessarily necessary. So in Rails, there's, there's a few different kinds of tests. We talk about unit tests, uh, and people might talk about you know, unit testing, and they're talking about sort of the whole ecosystem. But uh, specifically, Rails has a different, couple of different kinds of tests. Uh, you can read the, about these in the, uh, the Rails API guides, pretty good description on this, also in some of the other references that, that I'll give at the end of the talk. But unit tests typically go against your models. So this is very close to the code, uh, very little interaction with the rest of the system, you know, testing your business logic. When we start to get into functional tests, now we're looking at testing more of the controllers, um, some of the routing, um, you know, and also doing some view testing by looking uh, for key HTML elements, HTML elements. And I want to make sure that that distinction is clear, that we're looking for very key 
elements. We're not looking for styling. If you start testing for exact HTML, uh, your tests are going to be very brittle every time your designer or, or you make changes, tests are going to fail. So this is things like looking for uh, presence of tables, uh, rows, certain classes, um, and there's techniques that, that you can use that make those tests uh, less brittle. And then integration tests sort of stitch everything together. So these are tests that are going to test how your, your application behaves or pieces of your application behave as a whole. And these are t tests that will actually walk through your application, click on links, fill in fields, um, and just see how things behave. Just want to talk real quickly about sort of the basics of a test. We use a pattern called arrange, act, and assert, and the idea is we just break up a test into you know three sections so we set up any data that we need for the test in the arrange step we run the code that we're interested in testing and then we check the results to make sure everything worked and you know you want to make sure that you keep the test small uh, you're better off having several small tests that test very specific behaviors than having larger monolithic tests. It, it makes it a lot easier to make changes, makes the tests less brittle. You know, you want to reduce any um, dependencies in terms of ordering or preconditions. So by having a bunch of small tests, you're much better off. And we'll see some of that in the code that we walk through. And there's a million test frameworks out there. Um, test unit, RSpec and Minitest are three of the larger testing frameworks. Uh, test unit comes with Rails. Uh, it's starting to fall out of favor, or maybe it already has fallen out of favor, but certainly it's um, it's worth taking a look at, I think, just to see what the different styles are. RSpec is pretty popular. It's a BDD style, which is a more expressive uh, syntax. So it, it makes a, uh, uses a domain-specific language to uh, create a syntax that reads more like English. Minitest, I am not that familiar with, but I'm reading a lot about it, and it seems to be gaining a lot of popularity. It supports both the um, test unit style uh, and the RSpec style. And uh, Capybara is a tool for, it's a framework for integration testing. So what that's going to do is that's actually going to walk through your application. Uh, you're going to write tests that are, going to, that are going to do things with your application and then you're able to assert certain behave, expected behaviors. And I'm also using Factory Girl tonight, uh, which is a, uh, a gem that, that allows you to easily set up data for tests. That's often a challenge. Uh, test unit uses something called fixtures. Um, those get hard to maintain. Um, Factory Girl can be a little difficult to maintain as well, but I, I've, I've, so far it's worked really well for me. And the basic point is, you know, there are a million tools out there, and what works for me may not work for you. So try a couple of these out, see which ones sort of do speak to you, and use them. So really eager to get into the code. Um, and the application that we're going to look at is, is an expense tracking application. It's really simple. The, the purpose of this exercise is not the application. The purpose of this exercise is what do we do as developers? How do we work? And what I've done is I've uh, used, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to simulate the workflow. So what I've done is I've set up a bunch of branches in the repository so that we can look at snapshots in time of the development process. Um, I'm going to say a little something about using scaffolding. I'm not a big fan of it. It's good if you're trying to prototype something, and maybe it's good when you're first starting out with Rails, but you're depriving yourself of a better understanding of what's going on 
under the covers. I mean, I use the other generators. I use generators for controllers and models. I use generators for migrations and testing, but to just roll out that scaffolding generator puts so much code in your application that you may not even know what it's doing. It's giving you a false sense of security. And every line of code is a liability in your application. And by that I mean every line of code is a source of is a potential defect. So if you don't know why it's in there, and it doesn't serve a purpose in your application, it shouldn't be in the code. So in the course of this example, I've taken a real um, concerted effort not to put anything in that isn't driven by a test. And that's also a very fundamental um, driver in the red-green refactor cycle. You know, write the test that describes what it is that you want and then implement the code. So by definition, if you follow that process, there's nothing in the code that wasn't driven by a test. There's nothing in the code that is there, isn't there for a good reason. And uh, you can take a look at the repo. Uh, it's up on GitHub, uh, and you can look at it. Uh, feel free to, to check it out after, after tonight. The source code for this application is up on my GitHub account, uh, GitHub mdenemy uh, expense tracker. And you can uh, clone that URL. Just copy the SSH here. And we're going to open up a terminal window and do git clone. And then enter in the GitHub address. And that's pulled down the GitHub repository. And you can see all the branches by running the git branch with the dash A option. And what I've done in the repository is I've used a series of branches to capture steps in the test-driven development phase. So you see um, we're going through a series of failing validations here, uh, passing the validations, and then a refactoring, a couple of refactoring steps here in iteration one. Uh, the naming convention I used is the first number is the iteration number, and then the second number is what step in the iteration, and then we have a descriptive uh, name for the for the branch and if we go over to the readme file you'll see that the way I've structured the project is to do it in a series of iterations which if you're familiar with agile development uh, are small uh, phases that we go through in a project where we add uh, some set of features and iteration zero is just setting up the rails project um, you will not need to do this if you just pull down the the git repository, but you will need to run bundle install to make sure that all your gems are installed. In iteration one, uh, we create a model and we uh, put the model through a series of validations. So we see that the amounts must be greater than zero and every expense must have a description. And these are the branches that are used in iteration one. In iteration two, we're going to show all the expenses. So here we're going to have an index action and some basic view functionality that we need to write and test. And then finally in iteration three, we're going to add uh, the new action, be able to enter a new expense. And here we see our first uh, integration test with Capybara. It's also worth noting that in uh, iteration three, step six, I actually use a series of tags to capture what I think are more realistic steps in the test-driven development process. Um, some, of these early, some of these other branches are a little bit more coarsely defined, so I may define three or four failing tests in um, one of these steps. And normally if I was following a strict TDD, I would do one test, make it pass, refactor it, add the next test. Uh, but in the interest of keeping the number of branches to a uh, reasonable amount. Uh, I took a slightly different approach. And then in iteration four, just to reinforce the idea that uh, TDD is really a, a great process, but it's not going to catch every defect. And there were a couple of defects that snuck into this application. Uh, one is that the form that I, the way I set up the form didn't allow me to enter in decimal places. And that the index page wasn't formatting the currency uh, very well. So 
anytime you find a defect, the first step in fixing that defect should be to write a test. And again, we've gone through that process with uh, the branches here. Uh, first, in 4.1, I do some uh, setup work for getting a helper method in place to parse that uh, string input into something uh, that's a better, you know, better big decimal value for an expense. And then uh, iterations 4.2, uh, iteration 4.2 is using that in the new form. And then finally 4.3 is uh, formatting it in the index action. And again, same thing I did here in iteration 4 that I did in iteration 3 is to better capture uh, the process, I took a series of smaller steps and use tags to um, check those out. And I think it's really interesting, especially this uh, iterations 4.1 really give you a good picture of sort of a TDD cycle where I'm writing uh, tests for the uh, helper function to, to parse uh, a string. So I keep adding more functionality. First is the ability to just parse a simple string and then slowly adding in the ability to handle dollar signs and commas and what I do if somebody supplies extra decimals. And that's a, you know, that the, it's, it's also a good way to document what it is that, um, that you want your system to do. And just like uh, a branch, you just check out a tag by specifying it. So we can say 4-1-5 and then if we run the rake task, we should see uh, a few tests getting executed here. And you can see up here at the top, um, actually, where is it? Oh, here it is, the expenses helper. Uh, it's able to parse negative numbers, truncating values, commas, dollar signs, less than two decimal places. So again, sort of this is the functionality that is supported by the expenses helper. And again, I would I will leave it as an exercise to the reader to go through each of the different branches. But and again to check out a branch, it's just you know check out and then give the um, give the name of the branch. And then run the rake task. To execute the tests. So again, uh, feel free to browse through the different branches and get a better, hopefully that will help you get a better sense of the um, test-driven development red-green refactor cycles. So there's, there's a lot of good resources out there for test-driven development. The best one by far is Michael Hartle's Rails tutorial. Uh, how many people have done that? Okay, how many people followed the test-driven development practices in it? Okay. Um, try it again, too. I mean, I find myself from time to time going back to that. Less so now, but when I was first learning Rails, uh, I went through it, I think, a couple of times. Just trying to keep hammering that mindset in and, and also just learning good things about Rails. The thing I really like about this is he truly teaches Rails in a TDD manner. He will teach you how to use Git for make uh, feature branches. He'll get you deploying on Heroku. Uh, it's just a fantastic tutorial. Uh, another place to go is are the Rails guides. Uh, there's some great documentation in the Rails guides uh, for pretty much everything in Rails. I strongly recommend, you know, just browsing it sometime. You're bored, you know, how does routing work? Bang, you know, just go in there and see uh, what's on there. Uh, Noel Rappin wrote a book called Rails Test Prescriptions. It's a pretty good book. Uh, I think it's a good book if you're interested in diving deeper into um, TDD, but I also think you can get plenty out of the Hartle book for free. So that's a good thing. And if you're really curious about taking a deeper dive into TDD, uh, check out uh, Kent Beck's Test Driven Development. I think he talks more about Smalltalk in that, uh, in that, it might even be Java. But, you know, this, 
these ideas started up back probably in the 80s, so this is not something new. And uh, if you're really interested in taking a deeper dive, uh, I'd recommend the Beck book. So just to wrap up, um, you know, work tiny, work small, take small steps, uh, follow that red green refactor cycle, and don't mix up the steps. You know, go through it. Um, go th follow it fairly strictly. Write your test, see that it fails. Write just the just the minimum amount of code to make it work, and then refactor it, and then check in if you can. Um, I would, you know, I check in as often as I can. Uh, version control is a wonderful safety net. Uh, you should be using it uh, as much as required. And there is just a, a ginormous ecosystem of tools out there. Find the ones that work for you. And again, if you're a beginner, I would strongly discourage you from, you know, discourage you from using the scaffolding. It's great to get started the first time, you know, you, you write that first Rails app and wow, something pops right up. Fantastic. You probably think you're a heck of a Rails developer. But there's so much going on under the covers that you're depriving yourself of the opportunity to understand. And there is no generator that I know of that's fixed my business problem or fix this hairy defect. So if you're not familiar with what's happening with the scaffolding, um, probably not something that you want to be using long term. And this is just a, a little piece of advice. You're going to struggle with test-driven development. It's going to feel unnatural. Uh, it's, you're going to feel like it's slowing you down. It's not going to make sense at times. Uh, tests are going to be hard to write. But stick with it. it it's probably the best thing I ever did for my programming career. Uh, I would say test-driven development and pair programming are the two single most important things that I did to become a better developer. And it, it was hard, but I'm so glad I did it. So that's all I have. Uh, thanks for watching.